So this is about, I guess, the third year I've been in this conference, uh, and I'm just very intrigued by this whole area. Uh, they renamed it this year, Augmented World Expo. Um, so I guess something was wrong with augmented reality. Uh, you know, it's been around long enough to where people start having kind of certain associations with it. Uh, and today I just kind of want to ruminate a little bit on kind of, um, you know, what I think of as AR and kind of directions that I would like to see it go. And, you know, in some ways directions I would like to explore myself. You know, VR really, you know, kind of popped on the scene many years ago and had all this promise. You know, basically the holodeck from Star Trek, you know, was kind of the promise of VR. Uh, never quite panned out. I mean, we have VR systems and you can go in these worlds. But, you know, you kind of get simulator sickness, a little fuzzy. Uh, it just wasn't, you know, a really cool thing that we thought it was quite going to be. Now, AR, you know, of course, uh, has a lot of utility value. Going out in the world, kind of labeling things, bookmarking, getting overlays. Uh, as well as entertainment value. Um, personally, you know, from an entertainment perspective, I'm actually a little less interested in putting zombies on the real world and more interested in how we kind of focus in on what's actually there, you know, taking the actual reality and turning that into entertainment. Uh, when I think about, you know, the amount of computing power in my pocket, which used to be equivalent to what NORAD had, you know, 30 years ago, uh, and now I use that same computing power to find Starbucks, uh, it's pretty astounding, you know. So as a designer, we have this amazing amount of power at our fingertips to kind of play with. But it's always felt like AR, in some sense, has kind of represented a lot of interesting solutions looking for problems out there. Uh, you know, well, we've seen some really cool technologies, you know, uh, some interesting, very niche applications. Uh, but it kind of feels like it, it's searching for, you know, really, uh, you know, the sweet spot. You know, what should AR be hitting? Now, one of the premises of AR, I think, has kind of been that reality sucks, so we have to fix it. Uh, and how are we going to fix reality? <laughs> so. Which is kind of different than VR. VR is let's escape from reality. You know, AR is let's fix reality. Uh, you know, part of that really comes down to how do we empower the individual? You know, how do we kind of, you know, when we have this, you know, computing power in our pocket, it is amazing how powerful this stuff makes us feel. Um, and so I think that's one of the things that kind of where we can use reality to our advantage to further empower the individual. Uh, now, we're always thinking in terms of information that we can kind of present to the user. You know, we can put this layer of information between the user and the world out there. Uh, and, of course, we can kind of go totally overboard with that. Uh, one of the interesting things that's always kind of uh, struck me in reading about psychology is how much data is coming in through our five senses. You know, it's millions of bits per second coming in through our senses. Yet a very, very small amount of that actually finds its way to our stream of consciousness. So it's pretty apparent to me that a huge amount of what we call intelligence is really a filtering function. It's taking all this huge amount of information flowing over us every second of every day and pulling out, you know, those tiny little fractions of that data that actually matter to us, you know, depending on what we want to do, what our agenda is, what's relevant to us, what's threatening to us. Uh, that is, you know, probably most of our brain power goes to filtering out information from our stream of consciousness. I don't know, how many of you are familiar with uh, this guy named Daniel Simmons? He's done work in what's called inattentive blindness. Uh, it's really remarkable, and I would encourage you to kind of look him up and go to his website. I'm not going to kind of reveal some of the experiments and demos he has there, but uh, they're really remarkable that when your mind is focused on a particular task, how effective it is at basically blocking out huge amounts of data. Uh, and this explains a lot of, you know, kind of interesting things, like the way people will pull out in front of a motorcycle having never seen it because they were looking for a car. Their brain, in fact, did not allow that image of the motorcycle to kind of enter their processing. So this is something that, you know, I think is really relevant to AR. It's kind of the way our brain is kind of doing this filtering. Now, reality, to me, already has a lot of information. You know, as I said, there are hundreds of millions of bits flowing over us all the time. So, you know, my first thought, just kind of going down a different path here, was, you know, rather than trying to augment reality, maybe what we want is decimated reality. Uh, maybe what we want to do is, you know, actually put some filters and remove a lot of the stuff out there. If I had just simply a system that would, you know, remove information that it knew was useless to me and try to highlight and uh, make more visible the information that does matter to me, uh, that would be tremendously valuable rather than putting more ads in front of my face. Uh, you know, this really kind of goes in the classification of things that I don't want to know, TMI, you know. And there are a lot of things in the world like this. I used to have uh, a friend, he's a Chinese guy, and he worked for the FDA. And, you know, every time I was eating, he would be sitting there, you know, telling me what was in the food, you know. For instance, how many rat hairs were in peanut butter, you know. And he knew this because this is what he did for the FDA. In fact, this is how many rat hairs you're allowed to have in peanut butter. Um, but the world is full of things like this, layers of information that either I don't want to know or don't need to know. You know, usually it's in the second category, things that are just kind of distracting me from what I do want to know. Uh, Kevin Kelly, a friend of mine, wrote uh, this book, What Technology Wants, which is actually an excellent book. Um, he gave one of the best descriptions of Amish culture I've ever read. And uh, 
I began thinking, you know, they actually have, you know, this very uh, thought out, well considered kind of method for what technologies they adopt and don't adopt. And after reading that and thinking about it, I'm thinking maybe these want to be the early adopters of AR. Uh, you know, on the side of the decimating reality and filtering information out, I could imagine, you know, just as a thought experiment, you know, what would the Amish do with AR? And <laughs> you can almost imagine them, you know, <laughs> taking the world that's out there that really is not of interest to them, you know, putting this filter and overlay on it, you know, and basically allowing them to kind of, you know, filter out the things that they think are impacting their culture, you know, kind of live, you know, in society with the rest of us, yet live in their own reality, you know, in some sense kind of an alternate reality for the Amish, but allows them to not have to be segregated, they can kind of mix in. Um, there are also a whole category of things, uh, things that other people don't want me to know. You know, the idea like in reality shows, there's things, things fuzzed out, <clears throat> they don't want you to know the product, there's no product placement there. Uh, Google actually started doing this with their street maps in Germany allowing people to opt out of the street view, and so they're actually blurring areas of the street view in Germany. I think as people start moving to things like eyewear, uh, there's going to be a lot of back and forth about, you know, things I don't want to know filtering out reality, things that you don't want me to know. So in fact, a lot of the, you know, function of these things might actually be to remove information that's surrounding me right now. Now, Hollywood can also give us a lot of lessons about what sucks about reality. Uh, a lot of things that we kind of see, you know, we never have the perfect camera angle in reality. Uh, not everybody's attractive. Every minute isn't totally dramatic. Things aren't always black and white. There isn't always a clear resolution to everything. And of course, there's no laugh track. Uh, now, AR is probably not going to solve all these things, but I can imagine a few of these things that AR actually could be applied to, and I'm sure people will do this over time. Um, these will be really interesting apps. Some of them will probably start as entertainment, but uh, these are things that, in fact, you know, if I wanted to put a layer between me and reality, these are things that we have the opportunity to kind of go down these paths. Now, we're surrounded by screens all the time, and there are more and more screens around us everywhere. They're just totally ubiquitous. You know, and now we're about to start putting these screens right in front of our eyes. I started thinking about how much time do I actually spend looking at a screen, and I actually uh, thought about it in terms of how many pixels or photons are coming into my eye that are actually reflected off of the surface from a light or the sun versus emitted, you know, from a display device. And as I thought about it, then I started researching a little bit, and the numbers I found were astounding. You know, just the average amount of time that, you know, the average American spends looking at some sort of screen uh, and even looking forward. You know, this is a study where they said uh, in England that they think, you know, a kid born now will spend a quarter of their life looking at a screen for non-work related stuff. You know, add in work related, it's probably closer to half their life. So, so much of the world is actually coming to us, you know, from these devices right now. It's becoming probably the majority of our perception. So we're out there in the world we have direct perceptions of things around us. You know, from these things, we actually build world models. This is our direct experience. Uh, when I think back over time, you know, there was the invention of language, which is like 200,000 years ago or something. Uh, that would allow us to actually get experiences that we do not have directly. Somebody could tell us a story about an experience they had and share it. You know, then we had the invented, you know, basically imagery of different sorts. About 500 years ago, it was books. 200 years ago, newspapers. Each one of these forms of media is presenting the world to us indirectly uh, through media in another way. And, you know, they've been coming more and more often. 20 years ago, we had computers on the internet. Uh, now I have this thing in my pocket. And when I think about how much I know about the world around me and how much of it came through these various forms of media indirectly and are about to come, um, it's really kind of interesting and a little bit scary. And when I was thinking about this, uh, actually a question popped into my head, um, which you can probably guess. I'm sure all of you kind of came up with this question at some point in your life. It is simply, does New Zealand really exist? <laughs> now. I've seen maps of New Zealand, you know, and I see it on the globe and everywhere. I've seen a lot of pictures from New Zealand, movies, films. Uh, I've even met people from New Zealand, or they said they were from New Zealand. Uh, <laughs> I've actually never been in New Zealand, though. I have no direct perception of New Zealand. And I've thought about how much of the world, you know, is like that to me. I have no direct perception of. Um, you know, by the same token, I've seen a lot of maps of Middle Earth, uh, very detailed maps. <laughs> Uh, I've seen really cool, you know, films, pictures from Middle Earth. I've even met people that purported to be from Middle Earth <laughs> down in San Diego. And uh, so in some sense, Middle Earth is actually more real to me, you know, in my mind than New Zealand. Um, and there's some people that actually say these two places are the same, you know, which is even weirder. <laughs> but now, I find that I'm actually, even before I go to a place now, I'm like looking it up on Google Maps or whatever, looking at the street view. My perception of that place, even before I get there, is moderated through these mediums, through these screens. And it's very seamlessly kind of part of the world building model in my head. Uh, I'd like to think of it rather than augmented reality, I want to have a more of a customized reality, something that really is fitting me. And the 
putting a layer between the world, including all the bookmarks, signs, and symbols that are out there, filtering out some, highlighting others. Uh, you know, right now, you know, we can query stuff. I can pull a phone out of my pocket. I can kind of get information. And for me, I don't really mind that. You know, I think that's fine. If I really want to know something, I can pull out a phone and kind of query it. Um, it's not that big a deal, you know, if I know that I want, you know, the information I want to find. You know, sometimes it might be kind of advantageous to not have to pull the phone out of your pocket, right? Um, have it pop up. But even then, you know, it's a matter of where's that information coming from? Uh, you know, how do I tell it what I'm looking for? What's the input bandwidth? Or is it contextually aware? Does it know ahead of time, you know, this is the information I think you're going to want, so let me give it to you early. Uh, so actually, you know, I like AR to kind of go in a direction that is more a direct filter between me and reality. Not so much, you know, symbols putting on it or things that I would want to pull where I know what the question is, but things where it's, you know, basically presenting the world to me in a brand new way. As a kid, you know, there were these x-ray glasses in the back of the comic book that, of course, you know, you always wanted. Um, you know, you kind of knew they would probably never be as cool as you thought, uh, you know, if they ever arrived. But I can easily imagine, you know, that just, you know, having the ability, you know, kind of super sensory ability that when I wanted to, I could kind of turn a dial and see through things, you know. But again, in a direct perceptual way that's mapping into my intuition. Uh, one of my favorite books by David McCauley is this book called Underground, and he actually shows these beautiful drawings of what it would look like underneath a skyscraper, underneath the city, all the different infrastructure, you know, subways, water mains, stuff like that. I would love to just have a, you know, switch I could flip and look at down below my feet and see all this stuff underground, you know, and again, this is, you know, now part of my direct perception, not, you know, me putting bookmarks or restaurant reviews on top of reality. Uh, just the ability to maybe highlight certain things very subtly. You know, I love the idea of subtle AR that very, very slightly is altering the scene that I'm seeing in front of me. Uh, sometimes I just want to kind of maybe get, you know, strange and artistic and live in, you know, an impressionistic world like that. And it becomes more of an aesthetic experience. Um, other times, maybe I just want surreal. I want to get weird. But uh, in both cases, I want something that is kind of mapping straight into my intuition. Now, when we think about this going forward, I always kind of think back to other inventions. Alexander Graham Bell gave this great quote a long time ago. This is when he was pitching the telephone. Uh, he was trying to sell it to people and say how great it was. And he said, you know, I do not think I'm exaggerating the possibilities of this invention when I tell you that it is my firm belief that, that one day there will be a telephone in every major town in America. Uh, <laughs> now, this is the guy pitching his invention, telling everybody how great it's going to be. Um, you know, he just ha clearly had no clue, you know, as to how this is going to transform the world. You know, I think AR is one of those technologies that pretty much, you know, kind of has that set of possibilities. And we're, you know, just exploring a lot of things that really, you know, are barely kind of scraping the surface of where it could go. Um, you know, in some sense, I would like AR to really stay focused on reality. Uh, in some sense, kind of make it a very visceral experience. Something that, you know, I'm not sitting there, you know, punching computer screens, dealing with interfaces, something that's very smooth and seamless something that feels like it's part of my intuition and, in fact, is working with my intuition and not against it. Uh, and something that, in fact, helps me kind of see more beauty in the world um, and not just see the world as a better way to browse the Internet. So I'm going to stop talking right there. Uh, and I was asked to leave a little bit of time for questions. So thank you. Um, so if, you, if anyone has a question, if they can come up here and perhaps Philip can... You, do you want to start setting up? Don't be shy. Well, yes. Oh, no, come here, Sean, for the... Um, oh, you, you can hear me from here, right? But the, the, yeah. the recording can't hear yeah, yeah. you. So okay. I, I, I'm just curious, because I, I love that ending. Have you had an experience, preferably with AR, maybe something else, that actually did help you see more beauty in the world? Not with AR or even competing, I think. I have with photography a lot, uh, you know. Photography is very interesting to me uh, in that, you know, you're capturing a moment in time from a certain perspective. And, you know, then, of course, there are visual enhancements you can do to that. But um, sometimes just seeing this particular thing, it might even be a very familiar thing from a you know, particular point in time, a particular perspective, all of a sudden, you know, you see a whole different kind of uh, gestalt uh, from what you might just get walking around the thing. Uh, so I have with photography, and so I'm convinced it is something that uh, is entirely doable and probably to a much greater degree with something like AR. Anyone else want to shout out a question? There's one over <laughs> in the middle there. Uh. That's a good question. I mean, you know, anytime you have a technology like this, you know, it kind of promises all these efficiency gains, you know, like the computer just coming into the workplace, you know. Um, 
And you know, over time, it probably does uh, allow a certain amount of efficiency. But of course, there's a huge amount of inefficiency when you think about the average person. How much of the time on their computer are they really working? You know, versus just surfing the net, that kind of thing. Um, I'm not sure efficiency is really the right metric that I would want to measure this against. I'm sure that in very you know specific instances, I can say you know. Uh, aircraft mechanic, you know, having a heads-up display with his technical diagrams probably is more efficient than him having to prop up a manual. Uh, I think that um, I wouldn't really judge it so much against efficiency in terms of more how many possibilities is it opening up to you in the way you see the world, you know. I think if it gives people a broader uh, perspective on the world around them, especially the reality, uh, to me that is a much more interesting measure. Uh, if people have a deeper situational awareness, uh, of things that are underneath their feet that they walk by every day that they didn't know about. I think we're surrounded uh, with a lot of just fascinating, interesting, useful stuff around us that we're not aware of. And if the system understood which parts of the world to kind of expose to you, um, to me that would be a huge win. This is the last question because I think Philip's ready. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, probably the same way drugs could, you know, because I, in some sense, I think of augmented reality as a technical form of drugs, potentially. Uh, you know, people take drugs to kind of um, distort reality, see it differently, put different filters on it. Um, so, especially if you were using this day in, day out, you know, for long periods of time, you might become utterly dependent on it. Uh, you know, and when you, took, you know, unplug yourself from this data stream, a lot of people feel like that now when they go on vacation and they don't have internet access. You know, it's a weird feeling just kind of not being connected to the world. Uh, it's almost this um, sense that you're disconnected from something like the Borg. Uh, so I could certainly see people get like totally dependent upon this almost psychologically, yeah. But that's true of almost anything as far as that goes. But Okay, so I'll stop now. Yep. Thank, uh, you, thank you all very much. Thank you, Will.